It's 10 o'clock Saturday night, and Jerry Hansen is getting ready for bed in a small apartment where she lives alone. Not that Jerry has to live alone. She's still young, only 27, and as you can see, quite attractive. But after what happened last week between Bob and her, Jerry realizes that alone is what she can probably expect to be for quite some time. And there's something else she's begun to realize, that she's a different woman now, and that the scars will be a long time healing. And of course, Bob is different too. Maybe that's what hurts the most, knowing that if she had just had enough sense and strength and moral courage for both of them, things might have worked out. Insight. An exploration in depth of the spiritual conflicts of the 20th century. Insight. How do you do? My name is Father Kaiser. The love of a man and a woman for each other is one of the most beautiful things in creation. It enables the lover to peer into the soul of his beloved and see the etched there the face of God. This vision opens the soul of the lover. It frees him of selfish preoccupations. A kind of spiritual fusion takes place. She becomes for him an alter ego or other self. He finds feelings of generosity welling up within himself. And so he wants to give of himself. He wants to sacrifice his interests for hers. He asks only the privilege, the joy of loving. All this causes him to treat her with gentleness and respect. He cherishes her, he protects her. He wants nothing more than her happiness. The physical side of this relationship is not, as the Victorians would have us believe, a need or sinful thing. Sex is good because it's God-given. It is good because in marriage it can express and nourish the spiritual union which love brings about. It is good because through it, husband and wife cooperate with God in the work of populating heaven. Sex is an important part of life, but it's only part. To exaggerate its importance, to make it the totality of life, is to risk self-destruction. Sex can contribute great happiness to a human life. It can help the individual become the person God wants him to be. But it can make that contribution. It can give that help only if it is used as God wants it used, for the purposes designated by him. Jerry first met Bob about five months ago at an office party. Bob promptly asked her for a date and was just as promptly turned down. A week later, he phoned Jerry and tried again. She was secretly flattered, but for the second time, she begged off. Bob called once more the following week and Jerry finally agreed to have dinner with him. Two months later, they were going steady. So I said, listen, Harry, you don't want to be a branch manager all your life. You want to move on, move up, huh? District manager, regional manager, maybe even a vice presidency. You're only 39, and you know they have big plans for you. You laid it on that thick. Well, I had to, honey. Uh, he's got his feet stuck in cement. You know, he'd never move. Well, I'll say this for you, darling. You certainly are a salesman. Well, wait till you hear. I could see that he was eating it up, you know, mm -hmm. nodding his head like a Chinese philosopher. So I hit him with it. Harry, I said, next week you are appointing a new assistant manager. And frankly, I want that job very much. Now, I realize it's got to be your decision, and I also know that there are two or three guys who have been here longer than I have. Well, what did he say? <laughs> well, listen, I said to him, Harry, I want you to tell me quite frankly, if you think I am not the man for that job, then tell me that straight out so I can take advantage of an offer I've had from Allied. What offer from Allied? Well, no offer from Allied, hon, but I had to tell him something. He'd, he'd have sat there chewing his nails forever. Good grief, Bob. <laughs> well, sweetheart, it worked. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You mean you got the job? <laughs> I start next Monday. Oh, Bob, that's wonderful. Yeah. $35 a week increase and a percentage of every commission out of this branch. Oh, darling, I think that's marvelous. <laughs> but to tell him such a story... <laughs> well, I did him a favor. I, I got him to move off the dime. Now he's got a reputation back at the home office as a man of decision. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, no, I guess not. But you took an awful risk. Well, sweetheart, don't you realize that you're worth the risk? Now we can start making some plans. Really, Bob? Yes, really. You mean it's uh, trousseau buying time? Hmm. Well, as, as long as you hold it down to window shopping, you know, Mom, she's not going to believe this increase until I start bringing it home on a steady basis. I know. And that is going to be a problem eventually, too. Your mother? 
Well, it's the same old story, you know. I can't afford to keep her in her own place, at least not yet. My brother's got three kids, so there's no hope there. Bob, she could live with us. No, no. I wouldn't mind, really. No, no, let's not get off on the wrong foot, huh? I could tell you stories. We'll, um, we'll work it out, so long as you love me. Bob, you know I do. Well, then we'll work it out. Two weeks later, on Saturday night, Jerry invited Bob to dinner. She wanted to show off her cooking. He arrived at 7 o'clock with flowers, candy, and a bottle of wine. The first part of the evening was a huge success. But then the trouble began. Bob, no, we, we can't. Well, I don't follow this. You've got a ring on your finger. It's an engagement ring, Bob, not a wedding ring. And it only costs 20 bucks. You know I don't care about that. But you're supposed to care about me. Bob, I do care. And you know how much. Well, then? No. Uh, look, I, I just can't. It, it's wrong. It's wrong? That's the word. Oh, Bob. Wait a minute. Let's just stay on that. It's wrong now. But six or eight months and one marriage license from now, it'll be right. It'll be fine, huh? It isn't only the marriage license, Bob. Well, what else? I love you enough to wait. Don't you see, Bob? Then it'll mean something. It'll be a marriage, not, not just another incident in a, in a grimy little affair. In a grimy little affair? It's true. Oh, you talk like I picked you up at some bar or something. Bob, I don't mean that. Oh, I mean, if you think that something between us could turn into a grimy little affair, how do you know we're not headed for a grimy little marriage? Because we'll have gone into it with some self-respect. Self-respect. I'm wondering if you don't think this whole topic is grimy. I'm as human as you are, Bob. Well, then what are you trying to prove, Jerry? I'm not a hit-and-run artist, you know that. How many dates did we have before I even kissed you? A half a dozen? And even then, I asked you, I, I didn't shove you into some Bob, corner. Bob, we're not talking about that. What you're asking for now is... Is something I haven't the right to give. Why not? Because it's immoral. I wonder how many less neurotics there'd be if that word didn't exist. I can't say, but it happens to be a word that still means something to me. More than I do, huh? Oh, Bob, please. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's the truth. Uh, that's what it's boiling down to. You can give me all the slogans you want, but none of them mean anything unless they answer the big question. Do you love me as much as I love you? I may even love you more, Bob. Have you thought about that? I certainly would never ask you to do something you felt was wrong. Something that everything in your nature told you was wrong just to please me. Something in your nature told you this is wrong. There's more to human nature than that, Bob. I'm a person. I'm not just an animal. Oh, and I am. Well, I'm beginning to find out what kind of a person you are. I really am. All this talk about morality and self-respect, that's just so much shadow boxing. I know what's going on in your mind. I know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about number one, yourself. And there's a word for that, honey. It's called selfish. You're not just content to have a ring in your finger. You won't feel safe until you have a ring in my nose. Well, no thanks, honey. No thanks. All that week, Jerry waited to hear from Bob. A note, a call, anything. But the phone was silent and the mailbox empty. The following Monday afternoon, Jerry and one of the girls from her office were in a drugstore during their coffee break. What'd you do on the weekend? Nothing. You didn't go out Saturday night? Nope. You better get that boyfriend on the ball. These are your golden days. Take it from Mrs. Smith. Looks like I don't have a boyfriend anymore, Lois. What? Bob and I broke up last week. But you were engaged. I know. We had a fight, a big fight. Was it his fault? Well, I thought so for a while, but I'm not sure now. Then call him for Pete's sake. Swallow your pride. I, I don't know what to say to say him. Say anything. Say you're sorry. Just let him hear your voice. What was the fight about? Lois, if I tell you, would you answer a question for me? Sure. It's a pretty personal question. We're friends. I don't think you'll post it on the bulletin board. <laughs> well, uh, see, Bob and I can't get married for oh, at least another six months, maybe even longer. And uh, he, 
he, he doesn't want us to, to wait until then. I know. He can't eat, he can't sleep, etc. Anyway, I, I told him I couldn't. I really tried to make him understand why, but he just walked out. All I've done all week long is, is think about what he said. Maybe I am being selfish. What was the question? Hmm? You said you had a question. Before you were married, Lois, did... Did you and your husband... Yes. Were you afraid you'd lose him if you didn't? I guess so. Seems to have worked out all right. Well, he married me. That's what I wanted. Thanks, Lost. You called. Bob, I, I, I'm not trying to trap you into a marriage. I know. I was hurt, that's all. I just don't want this to be a, a mistake, that's all. It won't. Believe me, Jerry. I love you. I hope so. Making his request, Bob is not thinking of Jerry's welfare. He's thinking of himself. Whether consciously or not, he wants his pleasure, his satisfaction, his gratification. He accuses Jerry of selfishness only in order to mask his own. In acceding to his demand, Jerry is being taken in by the oldest lie in the history of the human race. When Bob says, I love you, let us sin together, he is contradicting himself. For love and sin are incompatible. Love demands sexual control, and sexual license undermines the very nature of love. The sexual act is a unique and privileged thing. It is a sacred act with sacred consequences. And God has instituted a sacred state for its performance. That state is marriage. We have been made in such a way that physical union presupposes spiritual union. Physical union becomes moral only when the couple's spiritual union has been given a permanent and sacred character in marriage. The natural partner for the sexual act is not someone with whom you make pleasant chemistry. It is that person to whom you have committed yourself for life. To engage in the marriage act prior to marriage is to subjugate the spiritual to the physical. It is to abdicate one's freedom, undermine one's dignity, and endanger one's love. It is two months later, two of the most agonizing months Jerry has ever lived through. She's written home about her engagement to Bob and her family is delighted. But as each day passes, Jerry feels less and less sure that there will ever be a wedding. Mr. Carpenter's office. Bob, I was hoping you'd call. Honey, is this thing tonight dressy, or can I go this straight from the office? Oh, what happened? Well, does it have to be tonight? Well, darling, if he isn't leaving until tomorrow, maybe, maybe you could see him in the morning. Yeah, all right. I'm sure he's an important customer. It was just a suggestion. Yes, sir. I'll be home. You can call me. Goodbye. Honey? Have you got any number two pencils? I'm all out. Yeah, I think so. 
You and Bob's had a date yet? Nope. I just asked. Jerry, he seems to be a pretty good guy. I wouldn't worry. Do you know how many dates he's broken with me in the last two weeks? That doesn't have to mean anything. Four. I think it does. What excuse does he give? Business. He has to entertain a customer. A big customer. Well, he used to see me every night. Where were the big customers then? Honey, you can't keep a man you're not married to on a leash. Even then, it isn't easy. Lois, I, I've made, I've made an awful mistake. And I don't know what to do about it. Hi. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? Boy, have I got news for you. Oh? What? Well, I kind of fibbed to you about where I was this evening. Well, not about where, but with whom. Yeah. I, uh, I just had dinner with the general sales manager of the whole company. He flew in today from Cleveland. Not just to see me, of course, but I was on the agenda. Bob, that's wonderful. Well, wait till you hear. This guy's name is Larkin. He's about 45, has a crew haircut, $300 suits, a star sapphire that'll knock your brains out. And this guy is a frozen popsicle. I mean, no blood in his veins, just ice water. But he can count, and he has been noticing the way the sales figures for our branch have increased since I took over as assistant manager. Oh, Bob. Yeah, with any kind of luck, I should be running this company in about 10 years. Then you can buy all the mink bedspreads you want. You mean you're getting another promotion? That I am. That I am. Oh, darling, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> hey. Hey, maybe now we can get married, huh? Well, see, that's the, uh, that's the hang-up. He, uh... Larkin put this to me on a kind of, uh, you know, uh, take-it-or-leave-it basis. And I'd have been crazy not to say yes. Put what to you, Bob? Well, uh, the new job is with the uh, home office. I've got to go to Cleveland, just temporarily, but... Uh, Honey, I could get a job there. Mm -mm. It wouldn't be enough. This is really going to be a tight squeeze. I can't bring Mom up, so I've got to pay rent for two places. I'll probably wind up sleeping at the Y. Bob, we could manage. Honey, I don't want to get it started off that way. I mean... If I'm married, I'm expected to entertain. Now, where am I going to entertain? In a parking lot? Let's be smart about this, huh? You give me... Give me a year. 365 days. That's all. Huh? Yeah, I'll be coming home on weekends. Every other weekend, at least. You give me one year. You'll be getting off that plane in Cleveland, and we'll get married in style. Doesn't that sound better to you? Lovely. Jerry, trust me, huh? Trust me. I have to, Bob. Hello? Oh, no, he isn't, but I expect him any moment. May I have him call you? Who? Oh, Mr. Peters, his boss. Uh, just a moment. Mr. Peters, does he have your home number? Well, certainly, I can take the message. Would he write and tell you where he wants his last check sent? <laughs> Couldn't you just mail it to him in care of the home office? No, no, that's, that's all right, Mr. Peters. Yes, I'll, I'll tell him. Thank you. our send-off. Vintage 58, than which there is no witcher. Get some glasses. Get them yourself. Huh? <clears throat> I said get them yourself. You don't pay the rent around here. Now what? I'll tell you now what. I'm tired of being used and lied to. That's now what. Okay, okay. Bob, I said lied to. <sighs> Jerry, this is going to be our last night for a while. I'd like to get through it without any fireworks. Now, you always suspect somebody is lying to you, mainly me. What's my latest? That you're going to Cleveland because you got a promotion? Well, who said I wasn't? 
Your ex-boss, Mr. Peters. He called here a few minutes ago to, to find out where you'd like your last check mailed. All right. I'm going there to work for another company. But it's still every bit as good a deal as I said it was. Well, then why did you have to lie about it? Well, if you'll calm down for a minute, I'll tell you. Here. Oh, don't soften me up with that stuff. Two hours from now, you're walking out on me for good, and, and I'm supposed to calm down? I am not walking out on you for good. Will you, will you just get that straight? New job, new town, new girl. Oh, there is no new girl, and that's why I didn't tell you, because I knew, I knew what you'd think. Please, please, don't give me another sales talk. I'm dumb. I guess I've always been dumb. But now I'm dirty, and I hate you for it. Jerry, listen. Oh, I've listened. I've listened to every slimy little pitch you've made to me about what two people in love are supposed to owe each other. It is what they're supposed to owe each other. You are wrong. Maybe you don't even know you're wrong. Maybe you believe that filth. But I don't. I didn't, and I don't, and I never will again. And anyone who does is just as big a fool as I've been. Jerry, I love you. But why wasn't that enough? Well, it is enough. I still love you. Oh. Oh, you still love me. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that reassuring? Well, you know what I mean. Oh, yes, I do. I know exactly what you mean. You still love me. Or you think you ought to. In spite of the fact that I've become a... a suspicious, whining... Frightened tramp. Oh, will you stop talking that way? I am that way, and I want to thank you for getting me there. For all the, the sick, slick arguments you used to make me forget everything I've ever been taught. Hey, you want to laugh? A little joke to speed you on your way? I used to go to church once in a while. Nothing excessive. Every third Sunday or so just to check in occasionally at the place where I picked up all those foolish notions of mine. Well, for the past two months, I have not been able to pass a church without becoming physically ill. That's what this, this great love of ours has done to me. Jerry, listen to me for a minute, all right? Okay, I'm a fast talker. Maybe I talked you into something you weren't prepared for. But let's be honest about this. It hasn't been all that hateful. I hated myself afterwards. I hated every minute of it. Well, I know you love me. I know that much. If you'll just believe that someday we'll get married, then... Then what? Well, I told you I'll be coming back here every weekend. And why can't things go on just as they are, huh? Jerry, if two people love each other... And you called me selfish. You have the nerve to stand here once and call me selfish. Jerry... After all the hell I told you this thing has put me through? We've already been like man and wife. We have never been like man and wife. Bob, a man and wife have trust and admiration and, and mutual respect for each other. We've never had any of that. And we never will. We, we threw it away, Bob. We haven't got a chance. We haven't. Do you think I would risk letting you be the father of a daughter of mine? A girl who might come home one day when she's, when she's 16 years old and tell you a boy tried to get fresh with her? Knowing that you'd say that if she really loved the boy, it would be all right. I wouldn't say that. It's what you told her mother. I'll call you next Saturday when I get in, Jerry. I won't be here. Well, that's up to you. That was a week ago. It's the following Saturday night, and Jerry is alone.
We said that Jerry lived here alone. The kingdom come. Well, not exactly. Not anymore. She just resumed the conversation with someone she hadn't spoken to for a long time. And now he's back. Jerry has a broken heart and a painful readjustment ahead of her. But with God's help, she can make that adjustment and build a full, happy life for herself. Of one thing we can be sure, Jerry will not make the same mistake again. She wanted Bob's love, wanted it more than anything else in the world. Yet she was afraid she was not worthy of that love, afraid she might lose it. This is why when Bob made his selfish demand, she thought she had to yield in order to keep his love. Now she realizes how tragically wrong she was. You do not earn love by abdicating your own dignity, but by being the person God made you to be, acting in the way God made you to act, obeying the laws he has written into your very nature. When you obey those laws, you enhance your dignity. You make yourself more lovable. When you disobey those laws, you degrade your dignity. You make yourself less lovable. It is as simple as that. Sexual indulgence undermines real love. It destroys the mutual respect upon which love is based. It tears sex from its divine context. It robs sex of its beauty. Those who are genuinely in love will learn to discipline themselves before marriage. They are impelled to do so by the very love which joins their hands and hearts. The whole problem of sexual control is not to love less, but to love more fully, more deeply, more humanly, more spiritually. The deeper one's love, the more perfect will be one's purity. Sexual control is natural, it is possible, it is necessary. You can be neither a Christian nor a human being without it.